We have a lot to cover today. Thank you everybody for coming out. Um, on our agenda today, we have a um, little bit of administrative work to do very quickly and, and finalizing our um, 2015 board member election. Um, then we will do a bit of a review, and I'm doing this in uh, large part in, um, because um, we have um, our new chief executive officer of the United States Western Federation with us, who will speak to you in a, in a few minutes. But I wanted to hear about the things that the North American Writers Group works on and, and, and what we're about. So we'll do a five-year review of, of how far we've come, um, what our priorities are going into the new year. Um, then Chris will come up and do a, a strategic plan overview. Beasy will unveil the North American Writers Group Top 25. And then Chris will wrap the meeting with a grant award for this year, um, the election results, and fielding a Q&A. Sound good? All right. Before we get into that, I would like to congratulate McLean Ward and Lauren Ward on the birth of their baby Lily just a few days ago. The board is elected in parts, so it, this is the existing board of directors, obviously very accomplished um, riders throughout North America. Um, we take a, and, and break the board into three parts, and then each, every, a third of the board is elected each year for three year cycles. So coming up for election um, this year, for re-election this year is Chris Kapler, Kent Barrington, Enrique Gonzalez, and Mark Samuel. So, um, Two from the U.S., one from Mexico, one from Canada, and then in addition, we are proposing um, and have put forth on the ballot two additional board members with Tiffany Foster and Lauren Huff. Um, each of these board members, if elected, will serve through 2017. And over the last month, um, you've had an opportunity, if you're a member, to vote for them online, um, as well as if you're a member when you walk through the door this evening. However, if there is anybody here that is a member that has not gotten a chance to vote and would like to do so now is your last opportunity. So is there anybody here who did not get to vote that wants to? Okay, then I officially declare the polls closed and um, if Janet, you can just tally up and we'll come back to the results at the, the end of the meeting. <laughs> All right, a little bit about the North American um, Riders Group and again I'm going to spend a lot of time talking to, to you, Chris. We are um, an advocacy group, pure and simple, a lobbying group that tries to influence and, and use the, our mission is to, for the, for NARG is to unite professional riders, trainers, and owners to use their collective strength to make show jumping in North America the best in the world. And there's lots of reasons for that, um, and we felt like the North American competition was getting away from us relative to Europe, and people had to travel, and it was difficult to become a I'm a professional rider and make a living and, and get our voices heard and that um, the Federation has, has does a fantastic job but there needed to be more of a voice for the riders. And that's what this group has been about. So a lot of the work that we do, you don't actually get to see um, in, in the news. It happens behind the scenes. So constantly throughout the year, we're fighting for the organization. So if you step back and you look at the last five years, um, there's been a, a lot accomplished. Uh, a big one, as an example, has been the North American uh, NARD, right, or the NARD Top 25. Um, that's been an interesting process. When we first started this, it was a little bit adversarial with organizers, and then a bunch of organizers um, started to embrace it, use it as a tool with their own boards, their own presidents, getting um, improvements, and. I mean, I will tell you, five years later, to me, it is just night and day, and, and we, we are so proud of the organizers in America now for the investments that they've continued to make, and we hopefully make some fun competition with the NARC Top 25, but the numbers, we haven't changed our rating system. We made minor tweaks to it, but the bottom line is in 2010, with the same group of evaluators across the board, to make it to the top, um, or the average in the top 25 was a 72%, kind of a, a C based on uh, the scores, and that's gone up to an 84% average today. And a two, the, 25, the 25th event in 2010 scored a 61, um, and this year that's gone all the way up to a 79. And, and again, that's because there have been dramatic improvements across the board from infrastructure to to footing, to VIP, to prize money, etc. 
Um, we've also given out $65,000 in grants thanks to the Heathcott family um, from Canada, and we'll be announcing a new grant again this year. Here's an interesting statistic. In 2010, one of our complaints was there were not enough FEI events, and you had to go to Europe if you really wanted to get a, a higher world ranking. There were four five-star events in North America back in 2010, and in 2015 this year, there'll be 12 five-star events in North America. That's a, it's a huge, huge change. And, you know, by the way, you know, there's three million dollar events, a million and a half dollar events, two half million dollar events. This is, this is a significant um, jump forward. From a governance standpoint, we said we needed to be um, more active in our um, governing bodies. And we've gone about aggressively supporting change. Um, I won't go in any particular order on the slide, but we worked with Bill Maroney and the National Federation to split out jumpers. And, and again, we are prominent, primarily not just a rider organization, we're primarily a jumper rider. We're not primarily, we are a jumper rider <laughs> organization. Um, so um, within the Federation and Bill, you know, there was some calls at the time for a separate national affiliate for jumpers. And instead, you know, Bill took the lead and did a great job and has separated out and formed an entire separate structure for jumper riders within that. Um, uh, Christine, we like to think we helped you get you elected. We nominated you um, for, the, for the president's job. And within that, there's been a lot of structural changes within the Federation. The board has gone from this big 54-person cumbersome board down to 19 riders, and NARD has Three of those 19 board members are um, sitting here in front of you um, tonight, which is a big deal, which means our, our voice gets heard. Um, we have um, Mark Samuel, which you'll hear a little bit about in a few minutes, um, has been appointed the FEI Group 4 Chair, which is a huge assignment for, for the FEI, and again, um, from the NARD membership. So, And we have people throughout all of the various committees, and be clear, their job is to hear the issues that you bring forth and then try to work through the, the federation structure to get rules in place and, and changes made that make show jumping in North America the best in the world. Um, we also sort of troubleshoot when there are specific instances, whether it's um, you know one of our first when we just were getting our, our, our feet wet with supporting um, McLean at, at Sapphire at the 2010 World Cup Finals, or. Tiffany and Victor at 2012 Olympics, Bruce Burr and what we thought was an unjust suspension. Um, we've weighed in and fought hard on the, the high boot rule, the vaccination rules, you'll see. Um, we were very influential in having write the initial rule, which has already been voted on and changed for the coming year, um, which is to every owner and rider's benefit. We're aggressively working to make changes to the mileage rule, and we've been supporters of um, the, the new, hopefully new, North American World Cup League sponsored by Long James. It's not, it's, it's 90, it's almost, it's at the one yard line. And, and, um, and it's not going to throw an interception. <laughs> but we're very so, supportive of it. Um, we also um, have, I don't know if you read about it this year, but we merged with uh, um, the International Jumper Riders Club. Um, which is yeah, in Europe, and there was a good reason for that, and um, we put three board members onto that committee as well, with Lauren, Kent, and Tiffany, and I'd love, um, Kent, if you could just take a minute to explain sort of, why don't we grab a microphone and give it to Kent, and explain sort of why that came about, why that merger was necessary. Basically, the, uh, the FEI was only going to recognize one rider's group. So it was very important that we came to an agreement with the IJRC, the International Jumping Riders Club. And um, now, as Murray said, we have three members there, including myself, Lauren Ruff, and Tiffany. And this means that all of our interests here in North America are, are represented, where in the past, the International Riders Club has, has been a big voice in the FEI but North America has basically been overlooked. So now it's our responsibility to represent our interests and make sure that we have a voice there with the FEI as a, as a right group representative. Okay, makes sense. And you know, the, the FEI was quite clear. We pushed originally to have our own memorandum of understanding and the answer was no way. It was gonna be one organization represented for riders around the world 
and um, we push to have um, great representation with these three to make sure um, that the issues of North America, which are not the same as Western Europe, are 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 represented and, and brought forth. So um, we're excited about that. Now, um, back on. I am not going to um, say that um, NARG is responsible for the winning that has gone on in the last year, but I will say that the fact that it is better, there's better prize money, better competitions in the United States, better footing to jump on, more visibility, has had to, at least in a small way, contributed to what was a incredibly successful year for United States teams. Um, we had great representation in, um, in Normandy, but beyond that, and Robert Ridland's better at doing this than I am, but you know, we, we were gold medalists in Hickstead um, with the USA, we were gold medalists, and I'll read some of these so I don't forget them all. Um, we were gold medalists in Hickstead, Dublin, and Guillaume with the United States. Top three placements for Canada and US in um, Aachen. Silver medal, Foster Bow, Bratislava, Wellington, Spruce Meadows, co 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 help me. Um, Team Canada Gold um, in New Mexico. What was the Skip that one. Team USA Silver, Team Bronze, 2004, Nick Cannon won the Nations Cup. I was at Spruce Meadows. It was a great day at the, at the Masters. Um, we were second place in the Nations Cup final. Um, or Canada was second place in the Nations Cup final of Barcelona. Americans were in the top 25 of the, we have many Americans in the top 25 of the FBI Long Team World Rankings. I think we have, um, I think we have a few in the, two or three in the top 10 right now. So, and we had, in the last um, three years, we had two World Cup finals winners. And it, you have to go back, for, before those two, it was a 25 year drought <laughs> from when we had won a World Cup final. So, I mean, we just had a phenomenal year. And again, if you listen to um, the coach of our team, Robert Rudland, talk about it, he'll say what's even better about the wins, besides we know that, you know, BZ's going to bring it home and, and McLean and these sort of seasoned pros, but that we had, you know, you know, half a dozen or a dozen youngsters jumping clean rounds around the world and really sort of filling the pipeline for the future. So it was, um, it was a, a great year, and I, I think that, NARG is helping to make that happen, but hey, that's just me. <laughs> what are we working on now? <coughs> Our priorities are the mileage rule, um, and I'll talk about a mileage rule task force, entry fee costs, um, which is a very hot topic right now, uh, North American World Cup League, vaccination rules, and some modifications we'll be making to the top 25 in the coming year. Mileage rule, I don't know if, um, you know, we've talked about it a lot in the past, but um, there is a natural conflict between the riders and uh, um, the organizers in, in this notion of providing so much mileage protection that it gives too much power to, to any one entity and therefore pricing power in a number of, of other issues. We've been very vocal of, about it in the past. Christine charged a group within the U.S. Federation um, that was comprised of some riders. Um, I was on the committee and a number of top organizers to say, can we, can we make some pro progress in the, the mileage rule? And a couple agreements were, were reached throughout the, you know, half a dozen meetings throughout the year. One of those was, and, and, and big organizers, Michael Stone's in the room, thank you for coming. Michael was, uh, was on there and led one of the subcommittees and Tom Spitzieri and others. And sort of the basic agreements, which have not yet been memorialized, but can be at the February board meeting to presidential modification, no pressure. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, are that no longer will there be mileage protection. Uh, if somebody wants to run a five-star event in the United States from now on and they get clearance from the FBI, um, no organizer in the US will be able to declare mileage as a, a, an objection against that. So if you want to run a strict, pure five-star event, um, you'll be able to as long as you get the FBI to, to approve it. A second thing which is tougher, and we need our representation with Mark and John with the FBI, is there are a number of things that make running an FBI event in North America, and I, I know John will push back on me and say it's the same as the rest of the world, 
but we need to make it easier here because this is a developmental market for the FEI that at expense on organizers that the, one of the committees came up with a list of things that they requested the FEI to consider making some modifications on to make it easier to run an FEI show and less expensive to run an FEI show in North America and, and we will support that. And then the third one, and this is um, being proposed, and again, hopefully it'll get ratified next week, um, will be an ex exemption, which will, or exception, be tested for a year and then hopefully made into a final rule that no individual venue could have mileage protection for more than six continuous weeks at a time. So that would say if you were at WEF and you ran six weeks, the seventh week you would not have mileage protection on. And then mileage protection would resume. And then for, for six weeks it would resume. So if somebody wanted to come in here and put a circuit the week before WEF started, the middle of WEF, and the, the week after, they could do it and create some competition in this market. And again, that's being dealt with by the Federation Board, um, and that was a recommendation by the, the committee that, that worked this summer. Did I get that right? Okay, good. Michael, did I get it right? Did it? <laughs> I got it right. <laughs> All right, so um, the next topic, and um, this is a controversial topic, and, and I can, and Lauren will come up and speak uh, about this, is the, the entry fee cost, and the rising cost of entry fees, um, especially here at WEF, and we hope you listen to that, Michael, not as an attack, but just understanding the concerns of the riders. Lauren? everyone. Um, I get the lucky task of talking about the hot topic now. Um, obviously this is foremost on our minds at the moment. Um, this issue exists at many events in North America, but let's use the last five stars as an example that we had here at WEF. I'm going to just quickly run through some numbers here that I'm sure you're all familiar with. The FBI jumper at WEF that week cost almost $2,000 before the horse was entered in first class. You have a $675, $675 stall fee, $800 other fee, a $250 nomination, $75 office fee, and a $73 federation fee. For showing the Grand Prix, add another $2,100 in entry fees. For other horses, add about $1,300 per horse. A typical rider showing three horses that week would have a bill from the show of between ten dollars and $12,000 in mandatory fees. Compare that to a typical five-star in Europe where the total fees would be less than $1,000 and include hotel accommodations for the rider. No wonder everyone is so upset. Think about it. There are between 50 and 100 horses in every FEI class, and unless you finish in the top three of one or more classes, there is simply no chance of recovering your expenses, let alone making a profit. So with, every, so with very generous prize money, only a handful of us break even or turn a profit while the vast majority of us struggle to make ends meet. Now the issue has the attention of the FEI. In fact, the FEI negotiated with WEF and had fees reduced. In the original draft schedule, there was fees to be even more expensive than they are now, believe it or not. NARC has provided input to those discussions that resulted in lower fees. What's even more interesting is that the FEI jumping committee thought that they had taken a, st a tougher step by limiting what would be charged in North America. For a five star, the limit was intended to be 1% in total. But the mistake that the rule was read is that it's 1% per horse. So for that same five star show, if the 1% limit in total by rider was in place, the maximum that could have been charged by WEF that week would have been 6,500, about half what was actually charged. NARC has been told that the FBI will revisit this rule this year. John Madden, who was recently installed as the vice president of the FBI, is here with us. Um, John, can you give us your thoughts? Please. Yeah, uh, thank you. Before I talk about the entry, I uh, will tell you one thing that uh, I hear NARC's point of view very clearly every, all the time from my wife, Beezy. But anyway, um, Lauren, thank you very much. It, the, the, I do want to say, and I guess Michael's in the room, uh, it was during the General Assembly and he and I had a number of conversations and uh, I, I don't want to uh, 
victimize or, or vilify uh, what has been happening here at WEF. They were doing things within the, the existing rules. I think it was a poorly written rule. And I want to uh, actually, actually thank uh, Michael for negotiating in good faith with us. And that brings uh, us right back to where we go from here. Where we go from here is I can say clearly that it was never the intention of the FBI Jumping Committee to have the rule exercised the way it has been. So it will be addressed in the April meeting. Uh, we'll try to rewrite the rule, and when we get that rule written properly, it can be put into place at the 2015 General Assembly for activation in uh, January 1st, 2016. The way we're going to try to put that rule together is we've called a meeting with a number of the organizers uh, here on the East Coast, West Coast in Canada so that we actually feel that they, their voice should be heard because we don't want an adversarial situation, we don't want a situation where they can't make a living. But on the other hand, we agree with NARC's point of view very much that as the star levels go up, the costs have to go down for the owners and riders. As the star levels go down, that, uh, that we can be expected to pay more for our sport. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, I just I would like to re-emphasize that this is a really, really important topic to us and that um, we're going to work really hard and um, try to make this a better situation for everyone. Thank you. I'll turn it back to Murray. So I think there's, you know, I think there's high likelihood that there'll be a significant improvement in that in the, the coming year. And, and Michael, I can't tell you enough how much we appreciate increasing prize money and we recognize the cost, what we're sort of beseeching or, or hoping you'll consider and management will consider that, you know, that, that high level of performance that, yes, I understand that those entry fees don't even begin to cover the total cost of the prize money and you lose money at that piece of it, but without it, you're not selling the VIP tables, you're not, set, you're not bringing in the sponsors, et cetera, and over time that some of those benefits could be shared with the riders. Something for you to hopefully consider. But thank you for what you've done in terms of getting more five stars here and getting more prize money. Next topic is the on the one yard line, the Lawn Noon Lawn Jeans North American World Cup League for 2015, which if you are interested in the World Cup, you need to pay attention to this presentation and uh, Tiffany Buster will walk us through the changes in World Cup showing in North America. Um, I'm here to speak to you about a few changes that are going to take place in the North American World Cup League in 2015. The first and most significant thing is that Longines is almost, just about, like Marie said, they're very close, uh, to stepping up their sponsorship. They have, they are hoping to put, around 1.4 million euros in prize money, 1.4 million euros in promotional and technical support, and around a million dollars in marketing uh, for these shows. This is about an overall $4 million investment. Through their support, these World Cup qualifying shows should have a much more modern dynamic and a more European feel. Another thing to note is that participating shows will be under continuing pressure from the FEI to keep the cost down uh, for competitors in these events like we've been talking about. Um, also, in the past, uh, there have been 12 qualifying events in, in both the East and the West. We were able to use six of the 12 to count for points. In the future, there will only be seven shows uh, hosting World Cup qualifiers uh, on each coast, and only four of them will, will count for points. The shows holding the World Cup qualifiers on the East Coast will be the International Bromont, the American Gold Cup, the Washington International Horse Show, the National Horse Show, the Royal, uh, somewhere in South Florida, just not at WEF, and Live Oak. And on the west, there will be uh, Thunderbird, Sacramento International, Del Mar, somewhere in Calgary, not Spruce, <laughs> Las Vegas, Valle de Bravo, Mexico, and Hipster, Mexico. And why won't it be a Spruce or a Because those are Rolex facilities, and this is a long gene event, so there's a conflict in sponsorship. Um, another important thing to take into account when you're planning your year is that the dates of these shows are a little bit more condensed than they have been in the past, uh, and they will be going later in the year, so that qualifying is closer to the actual final. 
Um, NARV was very influential in determining the, where the World Cup qualifiers were being held, and we are proud to say that 12 of the 14 shows are in our top 25. And now I will hand the mic over to Mark. <coughs> Thank you, Tiffany. I'm not going to talk about launching. Um, <laughs> oh, you had it about it. Oh, let me just have one more slide here. Hold on. Stay over there, Tiffany. It'll take me a second. We made two changes here, Tiffany. That was my mistake. Vaccination rules. One of the big things we worked on um, last year was a change to the vaccination rules, and the way it worked last year, or in the last few years, since some of the breakouts of some of the more contagious diseases, is a lot of organizers started putting their own individual rules into place, saying, you know, you had to have within 90 days or 30 to 60 days or whatever a certain set of vaccinations, which was not in the best interest of horse welfare, because in order to, to meet all those, you could have been vaccinating horses five or six times a year, which um, could have had a detrimental effect going on the horse. Long and short of it is we collaborated with Dr. Ober, um, and a few others, um, then worked with Dr. Shoemaker through the Federation. The FBI Veterinary Committee has passed a new set of rules and there is one standard and individual organizers can no longer ask for their own vaccination requirements and that's passed and that's in place right now. So your NARC membership was paid for with that alone. Um, <laughs> A big change. And then finally on the NARD Top 25, um, you'll see here shortly that as the organizers and the shows have gotten better and better and better, that it's, there's a number of ties this year for the first time. And in order to change that um, and provide a little bit more differentiation, because we want to keep raising the bar, we are moving from a five-point rating scale to a ten-point rating scale, which will allow for a little more differentiation between events. Um, we are adding a level of competitors and attendance score, so from you know, ranking lists um, to it's kind of like the, the, the U.S. points ranking list is. Um, and then we are going to have three different categories next year. So we struggle with you know, rating the series of WEF separate from, which we've never done, separate from you know, the final week, which is a five-star with half a million dollars, or with Tom area with a million from the full series. Or, and, or spruce the master separate from the, the series. This year we will have two categories. So it'll be just your best week will be in the top 25. So whatever the biggest prize money week is, that'll be the one that'll be in the top 25. Then we will have a score for best specialty show like we have now, and we will also have a um, best series. So, and that'll be, you know, I don't know whether we can narrow down the number, whether it's four, five, or six events, um, but it'll be a, a third category. And with that, Long and short, but we're working on a lot of things. I'm ready to get out of my school again. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Murray. Thank you, Tiff. And welcome to our Happy Family Award. In case you're wondering who all these people are, these are our board members sitting here that we're introduced before. Um, I stand out as the only pale faced one because I live in Canada while they're all riding down here. So, uh, Murray asked uh, me to give a little context to my experience on uh, the FBI Bureau. I started as Canada's rep to the FBI four years ago. From that, I was elected to be the Group 4 rep to the Bureau, and that has me sitting on the Bureau along with the discipline chairs. Uh, making decisions not only about show jumping but about all disciplines that I know a little bit about, which makes it dangerous. Um, it was through the, it, it was very interesting working under Princess Haya, um, under her tenure, and now we're into a new era with Ingmar de Vos. Um, I think it's a very exciting era. Uh, we have our very own John Madden as uh, first vice president. Uh, and John brings a great deal of uh, industry background and common sense to the, the dialogue. And I think it's uh, going to be a very exciting four years for the FBI. Uh, through that uh, world, that's how I actually uh, met our keynote speaker, Chris Walton. And it's my uh, pleasure to introduce him to you today. Uh, Chris uh, started as the new CEO of the USEF in June of 2014. And uh, I'm sure it's been a whirlwind of a, a learning experience for him. Uh, Chris uh, 
replaced John Long, who had done an admirable job uh, as CEO for a number of years. And Chris heads up the executive branch of the USEF, uh, as opposed to Christine Tauber, who many of you would know. Um, and Christine heads up the governance side of things, and I'd say more of an executive governance side of things, because Christine's very involved in the issues as well, and uh, does a fantastic job on, on behalf of this federation. Uh, Chris is a lawyer by training. Fortunately, he moved off of that quickly and uh, has almost 25 years in uh, high performance sports, primarily in marketing and sponsorships. Uh, Chris's first uh, major responsibility is with the uh, Atlanta Organizing Committee as uh, Vice President of uh, Marketing and Sponsorship. And uh, that's when he then demonstrated his uh, skills as an entrepreneur. As uh, once that uh, responsibility came to an end, he founded uh, Meridian Management and sold his services back to the IOC and to other organizing committees uh, in the field of sponsorship and marketing. And uh, also showed an expertise in the television rights side, side of things. Um, the IOC then came to recognize the value of uh, Chris and his company. And uh, when they decided to take that capability in-house, they chose the best way to do that was to purchase Chris's company. And, uh, and uh, so Meridian became part of the IOC. Uh, following the sale of that, uh, Chris became Chief Executive Officer of Helios Partners. And uh, that was also an international sports marketing firm and did an awful lot of work for the top sponsors of the IOC uh, through that, including Samsung, Lenovo, Dow, and uh, many other uh, organizing committee sponsors as well. Uh, I think that's what Chris uh, or Christine was looking for in the next CEO, was that entrepreneurship spirit, that uh, familiarity with our, uh, our industry, but not someone that was too deep in the industry and uh, therefore too uh, committed to the status quo. And uh, Chris certainly brings an international perspective to his job, and even though he's only uh, eight months into it, uh, my experience has been that he brings a, a serious-minded, professional attitude, uh, a new vision, and Chris today is going to share with us a State of the Union address on where things are at with the USEF, and a bit of a glimpse into the future. Chris. probably all looking at this picture and have the same reaction that the TSA agents have when I try to go through with my driver's license. <laughs> this didn't happen in just eight months. This has been happening for several years now with the gray hair. But, uh, and thanks, Mark, for, for that introduction. Uh, this will probably not be the first time that's happened to you when you introduce an American who's going to give a very U.S.-centric uh, presentation here. Uh, so I apologize for that. but. Uh, and a lot of the things, having spoken with even others, uh, that, the, that our Canadian friends and, and our Mexican friends are experiencing are the same things that, that we're experiencing at uh, the U.S. Equestrian Federation. So I think there's going to be uh, a lot of, of cooperation among all of us that we can do together uh, to, as, as Murray said, uh, raise the profile of, of equestrian sport in the United States and make it uh, on a par with any other uh, region in the world, as, as all of you in this room deserve. So, to uh, here's, my, uh, here's my clicker. Um, and to give you a bit of a warning, you are only going to get a glimpse of, uh, of our planning process uh, as it is today. Uh, I gave a presentation at our board meeting in January that went four hours. You will be spared that. I'm going to try to keep this to 15 minutes because I, guess I sit precariously between the the early cocktails and the, and the post-meeting cocktails, so we'll get through this as quickly as possible. Uh, I also know that Chris mentioned uh, before that, that many of the people in this room probably didn't even realize that the that USEF has a CEO. Well, it, it does, and, and I admit. So uh, you'll, you'll learn, I hope, a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish at the USEF um, in order to, to promote and grow equestrian sport in the United States and, and in particular uh, what we're trying to do to, to promote the, uh, the efforts of and assist high performance riders from North America. So 
with that, um, let, let me tell you where we are, and, and frankly, I, I hate to start on a bit of a, of a down note. Uh, I have to admit, I, I got a little jealous when I heard Lauren talking about all these fee increases and, and uh, numbers rising. We, we haven't increased our fees at the USEF since the organization was founded. And as a result, we're, we're frankly in a, in a kind of a break-even situation. The only reason I say that is because it has affected um, the ability to give you the kind of support you deserve, and, and that, that absolutely has to be fixed. It's also important to note that we have 17 uh, different department heads participating with me in the development of this plan process, uh, and one of them is for so there are a lot of other parts of this organization that require resources. And again, the reason I'm saying that is, is so that you understand that we have to get those in order as we're helping to promote our high performance athlete. Because if we don't, they pull resources, they pull time and energy again uh, away from, from what we're trying to do for the people in this room. And I can assure you that, that all of us uh, enjoy watching the great athletes we have in this room perform. We enjoy watching uh, watching the events. We enjoy reading about you. We enjoy seeing you. We enjoy hanging out with you uh, more than anything we do. And we'd like to spend a lot more time working to make you guys successful than, than some of the other things that, that we have to deal with. Um, uh, like I said, we are on a bit of an unsustainable uh, trajectory. We, we have to change that. We have to turn it around. We can't do that by cutting services. We're already pretty thin as it is. So the only way that we can do that is by growing equestrian sport in the United States. There are a lot of little things that we can do by, as I said, by reevaluating our fee structure um, and, and creating other revenue streams. But we really have to grow the sport in order for the Federation to flourish and for us to provide the kind of service we, we're gonna, we want to provide to you. So um, in, in order to do that, we had to go back and start at the beginning. I don't know how many of you even knew that there was a USEF mission statement, uh, but it was about a page long. Uh, it looked like something that had been uh, created by a, a congressional committee. Um, and so we, we threw that out. And at the last board meeting in January, we adopted a a new mission statement that is much more concise, uh, but as I'll take you through here in a minute, you'll see that it's, it's really quite fulsome. It's, it's, it's much shorter, but it is more fulsome than the one we have, and the emphasis in this thing is on growth, and I'll just, I'll just read it. What we want to do at the United States Equestrian Federation is raise the level of access to and participation in equestrian sport at all levels by ensuring its continuing creativity, growth, and excellence. So, as I said, let me just kind of deconstruct that for you and tell you what, what we mean by that short little statement. Well, what does raise the level of access to? More people, uh, make, making the sport more visible. I, coming into the sport from, from, from the outside, we have made it very hard for people who have not grown up in the sport to understand it. We have to fix that. We want more viewers on TV and on, and on our network and on anybody's network. We just we want the sport visible. We want it accessible to people. We want to increase spectators at events. Um, I don't know that we'll ever get too close to the European model, but to the, to the extent we can get spectators who are willing to pay to come to events, we can take the pressure off the exhibitors to, to fund the cost of those events and, and, uh, and help everyone. Um, again, I can't hit on all of these. You'll see them. I'll have a copy of these available for you afterwards. But we want to promote events, athletes, and horses. There's no reason that you and your horses should not be superstars. And we want to, we want to help work with you to make that happen. You all have your own marketing outfits. NARG is doing marketing. But the Federation ought to be your partner in those efforts. I'll get to a little bit more about how we're doing that uh, a little later. And, and finally, we just we need more of everything. We need more people riding. We need more spectators. We need more opportunities for people to watch uh, on television and on broadband networks. We need more people organizing events. We need more breeders. We need more owners. We need more money. And we need the right partners. Um, and that's what we're driving at. What does it all levels mean? Well, I made a comment um, in my first day on the job, which just happened to be a board, board meeting. I wouldn't suggest anyone if they take a new job to start a board meeting, but I did. And uh, one of the things I, I said was that if you had to be able to, to compete in the NFL to enjoy a football game on a Sunday afternoon, the NFL wouldn't be a $10 billion business. 
we have to find a way to reach out to people who have an interest in horses, equestrian sport, who would, who would be fascinated by what you do, who would love the beauty of what you do, and reach them and make them fans, and make them part of the experience, and frankly, make some money off of it if we can. Um, so we need, we need all of these things. We need more people sponsoring. We need more people being entertained. We need more people being a, a fan and just, and just sharing the passion. So what do we mean by, uh, again, at all levels, um, starting at the grassroots, you know, there's a, there's a pyramid of equestrian sport in the United States and you sit on the top of it. But it's very important for us as the, the Federation to make sure that the bottom of that period, which supports you guys at the top, both financially and in terms of uh, just participation, allowing these shows to, to happen and to prosper, it's very important that we keep that healthy too. So that's, a, that's an important goal for us. It doesn't mean we're forgetting about you, but it's, it's something that we have to do again for all of us to proper, uh, prosper across the board. And then obviously, we want to continue to grow uh, the, the pool of world-class talent that we have, uh, the, the pool of support personnel, the people, the federation who work on your behalf. Here in this room, you guys are blessed to have probably our, our best people working on your behalf, but, but we, no pun intended, we have ridden them hard. And, and they need help. And, and, and I, I'm serious on this one. I'm, I'm not, you know, the, the work that, that uh, Lizzie and Robert and others do for you guys is just outstanding. And in the last year before Will Connell got here, they did it without, without support director. Just a truly remarkable job. And we've got to make sure that they've got the support and the resources that, that will allow them to continue to do that kind of job or an even, even better job for you. Creativity and growth. Um, I am uh, I am a traditionalist at heart, but we have to do some things differently. We can't just continue to run, uh, allow shows to run and to do things the way they've always done. And we're making we've already made some fairly modest change, and it's 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 a, probably expect to be expected that people people resist change. Well, we have to keep pushing to move the ball forward and, and make use of technology, make use of, of all of the assets that we have available to help grow the sport. So we are going to be slowly but surely uh, pushing to allow the sport to evolve. There have been, uh, and, and, and we want to encourage organizers to take, uh, to, to be creative and to do some things differently. Um, Michael, your show in, in Central Park is a, is a good example of, of one of those types of things that was very creative and raised the visibility of the sport. And um, we, we want to encourage others to do those sorts of things that increases the visibility of the sport, gives opportunities for riders, provides additional opportunity for riders to increase their income and, and prize money and those sorts of things. And we want to promote, as I said before, we want to promote our athletes and our horses both domestically and, and internationally to make you guys as well known as you possibly can. Again, working with you and the teams that you already have. And then finally, excellence. Excellence kind of goes without saying, particularly, particularly when you're talking about elite sport. But I'm not just talking about it with respect to elite sport. Everything we do at the Federation, we have to be excellent at. We have to be superior at. And, and right now, um, I, you know, I think the last 10 years has been a period of sort of finding stability in the organization. Uh, but now we've got to take it to another level, and we have to have the resources to be able to do that. And that comes through through growing the sport, as I said before. Um, you know, the, the, you guys are the most obvious examples of excellence because everybody knows when you win, you get a medal. That's obvious, obviously an example of excellence. But even with, within the Federation staff, we need to do a better job uh, making sure that all the functions that we serve on behalf of all of our constituents are done with excellence. Because when we don't, um, you get heat in the system, you spend your time fixing problems, you start reacting to things, and you can't spend your time being proactive and trying to really look to the future and how you improve the sport. So, what are the big strategic opportunities that I see for us this year? Um, we are developing a strategic plan that, that, that has We'll have goals and objectives for each department, and we'll have work plans for how we achieve those goals and objectives. But obviously, um, we need to get this sport out to, a, to an extended audience, to a non-endemic audience, and that's one of our big opportunities. Uh, as I said, we have to work uh, more closely with our affiliates. 
we have to make them partners with what we do. We have to grow the base of that pyramid uh, to make sure that it can support you in every way possible. Then we're going to use you guys. Um, and again, I'll use the term, we're going to ride you hard uh, because you are, you are what we can promote in terms of sponsorship, in terms of media. Um, obviously, we're not going to, we want you to get the benefit of that uh, more or as much as, as we do. But we, we need you to help us to promote the Federation and in turn to allow us to in turn promote you um, and, and allow you to prosper and, and make as much out of your profession and your, your sport as you can. We need to take our marketing efforts to the next level. Um, we are still not at the point after eight months where I can tell, uh, where I can walk into a, a CEO or CMO suite and tell them why they should be associated with the United States Equestrian Federation. We'll have that fixed very soon, but we have, we have to craft assets uh, that will allow us to get sponsors and, and the corporate community uh, interested in participating with us. And when they participate with us and they start leveraging their sponsorship, hopefully they'll do more with organizers, they'll do more with, with individual athletes, and we'll all benefit. If you, look at, if you look at how most companies market, they don't just buy one piece of a sport. They don't buy one element of a sport. They buy all elements. They'll buy, in the case of the NFL, they'll buy the league, they'll buy teams, they'll buy athletes, uh, and they'll use all of them in different ways so they have a smorgasbord of opportunities to, to promote their association with the sport. So, just a little bit on the note, we have hired two outside agencies to help us. Uh, those of you who were here a couple of weeks ago when we had a, a small meeting to introduce uh, remark to you. Uh, this is a small boutique agency out of LA. The woman who runs it is named Lauren Kay. She is a writer, so she understands the sport. Uh, they are helping us with media placements, which we already have uh, uh, in some endemic media, but mostly in non-endemic media to get out to a much broader audience. Uh, the message of equestrian sport, uh, promote many of our athletes, um, and, and just raise awareness of the sport among the people who, who really quite don't have an understanding of it at this point. Um, we are uh, we're trying to create a buzz around equestrian sport and put it on a par with some of the other sports. With, with the opportunity we have in the United States that we see in the United States, 320 million people, uh, there's no reason that this sport should not be much, much bigger than it is. Um, and, and there are a lot of people, I think, who would, who would love being able to enjoy and appreciate this sport, even if they don't actually uh, attempt to, to get on a horse, and, and we have to make that available to them. We're really making a bit, big effort in social media. Obviously, that's one of the easiest and cheapest things you can do at the very beginning, and Remark is helping us do that. So we need to, to coordinate with NARC, coordinate with you as individual athletes with what you're doing, and make sure that we maximize uh, the social media outreach to, to all of our constituents. I never thought I'd say this, um, but I have also hired IMG. In my previous life, um, I used to call them the evil empire because um, they're everywhere and they were so good and it was really difficult for a, for a small agency to compete against them. But because they are so big, they are in companies' headquarters every single day of the year um, and they've got, they've got a very long reach and they've got a lot of influence. And, um, they have agreed to assist us. They did a back in the fall. They delivered a. Uh, they did an audit for us to kind of look at the opportunity. Um, there's a typo on that first line. They they confirmed our our addressable market size at 30 million people. There are 30 million people they think that would have a, a strong interest in equestrian sport based on owning horses, <laughs> riding, being previous riders, or knowing someone else who rode. Um, at the Equestrian Federation, we have about 82,000 members out of that addressable audience of 30 million. So it represents a huge opportunity for us. You know, when they look at our demographics, when they look at our personalities, when they look at the excitement of the sport, their words were that this is a part of the field. So we're going we're gonna to take advantage of that. We have a strong web audience and traffic numbers. Our, our network is, is uh, from a technical standpoint, is, is doing extremely well. We've got to figure out how to make money out of it. Um, but we have active and gay social media channels, um, and they see the equestrian sport as, a, as an untapped market. I think it's, uh, we're about to sign a contract with them, and I, 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 I'm very enthused about having IMG on board because IMG does not take on assignments that they don't think they can do well in. Um, and I see this growing. They're working on behalf of the Federation 
but we're already talking about how to build packages, um, and that's actually on the next slide, how to build, uh, understand how, how we are perceived in the marketplace, how we can be perceived in the marketplace as a sport, how to big, build asset packages that, as I said, as I, as I alluded to before, will not just include the federation, but could include specific events and organizers, can include uh, you guys as athletes and riders, and then help us determine how best to sell those packages. So you'll be hearing a lot more about that as we look to cooperate with you guys and, and form packages to, to go to sponsors with. So now, uh, what are we what are we trying to do with you guys? And you've probably heard Will Connell talk about this to, to some extent. Um, but being successful in the least sport is is really relatively simple, at least from a conceptual standpoint. You got to you got to identify talent, you've got to coach it up and maximize the potential, and then you have to perform at the appropriate time. So it all sounds, it all sounds very simple, but you, there are a lot of resources that go into making that, making that happen. Um, when, it, when it comes to elite sport, um, we are not, that part of our organization is not about sport for all, it's about winning medals. Um, it's about identifying those talented riders and horses, uh, working with them to make sure they reach their maximum, maximum potential. You all have your own teams, we know that, but we need to build an infrastructure that allows you to be as successful as you possibly can. Um, again, our sport department, I think, has done a, a tremendous job, but they need more resources, and we want to be in a position to give it to them so you have everything you need from your federation to be successful. We're a business that, that produces a product, and there's only one way to keep score, and that's medals. And, uh, London was, was disappointing, I know, to everyone. Um, it's hard uh, to turn that around uh, in a short period of time. We need to have a long-term horizon. We need to start inve investing immediately uh, and, and do the best we can in Rio and win as much as we can there. But our real target is uh, for ultimately getting back to the position we need to be is Tokyo, which, by the way, on, June, on January 30th was just 2,000 days away. Uh, so it's not too early to start working working on that. We see ourselves as the integrator of all these efforts. Uh, we are squarely in the middle. Again, we need to provide the resources to you to allow you and your teams and your F and, and your coaches and your the, the people who work with you and assist you uh, to maximize their potential. And uh, as I said, we've got we've got great people working with show jumping. Uh, we need to, to bolster that team uh, and. and do as much as we can to help you guys be successful. Um, and as I said, we're not just looking at the next competition, but we want to be successful over time. We want to return to the United States equestrian team being the premier equestrian team in the United States, which I, I believe is its rightful place, and I know all of you in this room believe that's the rightful place in the United States equestrian team. So we're going to start investing in systems and infrastructure that's going to help us do that do those things that I just said are necessary. We've got to get off of a, of a 12 month budget cycle. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, our plan is to have a 96 month plan, which is an eight year plan with a 48 month budget cycle. So we can actually start putting in place development programs that know they're gonna be funded uh, and, and working on a long term program to develop talent in the United States to make sure that we ultimately get back on the metal podium. And, um, you know, this is going to take a, a big shift you know, from the way we've been operating internally, and it's going to take a lot of resources that, that we need to find. Um, we'll be defining those needs over a 96-month cycle, as I said, and a 48-month bu month budget cycle. Um, but the idea is to look as far ahead into the future we can and keep, keep people in the pipeline uh, to get us back on the podium and, and keep us there. We also have... Uh, We've also made tremendous strides with the IDC in terms of, of changing the way that the IDC operates, getting away from, again, as I said, a short-term approach and going to a more long-term approach and, and using the people on the IDC, the Interdisciplinary Council, uh, to be able to, to, to help lend their strategic direction and their vision, but not get bogged down into the day-to-day -day, uh, intricacies of what's going on. Um, we have to do that. We have to have to let the professional staff uh, do what they need to do on a day-to-day -day basis and free up the members of the IDC to try to do, to do, to lend their strategic vision and their knowledge base to what we're trying to do. 
And then finally, we need to we need to figure out how we're going to work with you guys. This is, uh, you know, I've, I've spoken to Murray about this group, but you know, when you look out at this room and the resources that are in this room, we need to take advantage of, of the the passion that is here, what you guys have already done, what you've accomplished over the last five years, as I as I just learned about earlier, and, and figure out a way. Uh, that, that we can rely on you, you can rely on us more, and we can work together to maximize the potential of the team. So just to summarize, it's real easy. Identify talent, coach it up, maximize potential, and then perform at the, at the time that is necessary to win medals. That's a simple proposition, but there's a lot to go behind it. And uh, your commitment from me uh, on behalf of the USCF is that we're going to do everything we can as an organization to make sure that we are supporting you, that we are making you as good as you can possibly be, uh, or at least giving you the, the, taking away the distractions and giving you the tools you need to be as good as you can possibly be. And uh, I don't want to be looked upon as a regulatory agency. I want to be looked upon as an entity that is helping you guys achieve your dreams and achieve success. So thanks again for having me and good luck.
and it raises a ton of money for a great charity. So uh, for this event, I, I think it's one of those events that the equine industry should get behind and support more. Thank you. Okay, moving on to our top 25. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of these, but uh, just a few things I'd like to know. Live Oak is a new newcomer to the top 25. It, we recent, previously had it in the specialty category, but it really, over the years, it's become a regular CSIW, so now it's in our regular top 25. Um, Upperville is also new to our top 25. That made big improvements this year and jumped into it. Um, I'd also like to point out a few things that Murray touched on earlier. When we started in 2010, we had four events score 80% or higher. This year we have 21 events that scored over 80% 80, 80 or higher. Also the score required to make the top 25 was 61% in 2010, and this year it took a score of 79% to make the top 25. Um, so again, these are, these are all good shows. Um, I, I can't really speak of all of them, but they deserve some uh, attention. So on your way out, you can pick up our pamphlet and read about all the, uh, the reviews on all of them in our publication. And getting into the top 10, uh, we have Atomi, I think is how you say it. It's, they say it's one of the best venues in Mexico. Um, we have Devon, the Hampton Classic, the National Horse Shows, all those classics of ours in the United States. And we have... Yeah. At number six, we have... <laughs> <laughs> also the same that Murray was struggling with earlier. It has two difficult names to pronounce, apparently, this show. But uh, coming in with a score of 89% this year, um, Alapa also... Score, uh, wins the award for our most improved this year. Learned from, from scoring a 76% in 2013 to an 89% in 2014, Alapa went from ranking 20th to ranking number 6. Having a superb grass field, improved footing in the warm up areas, and hosting the Pudicia Nations Cup this year boosted at 14 places in the rankings. And here to accept our award is Nicholas Pizarro. Hi, good night. On behalf of the Chedrawi family and the Mexican Federation, it's an honor for, for these two couples that have been doing the show now for 17 years. Uh, they really try to, to make it better every year. Now they did international. This year we will have two international four stars. It's the Nations Cup the first week and the second week just international. So you're all welcome to go. I will be really happy to host you there. Thank you. And in the top five, we have coming in at number five, the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair. Um, with nearly a full house every night, a truly international competitors and extensive media coverage uh, make this one of the, sky, the highest scoring indoor events on our East Coast circuit. <laughs> Coming in at number four, a very welcome newcomer, the, La the Longines Los Angeles Masters. Scoring a 90% in its first year here, the EEM management company brought its successful formula it uses in Hong Kong and Paris to the LA Convention Center, along with many of the top riders and horses in the world, scoring a 90%. And again, at number three, we have the American Gold Cup. With its dedication to the highlighting the top sport and show jumping, uh, its increasing sponsorship and spectator appeal, the Gold Cup remains at number three on our list. <coughs> number two, again, Thunderbird Show Park. I've personally never been to the show, but anybody who has been there uh, raves about it. Our evaluators always rave about it, and we've used different ones uh, this year <laughs> as well. It came in with the same same result. So um, it's uh, they say, and the management is always very open to um, our input and to all the competitors' input as well. 
And again, the number one event in North America, Spruce Meadows Summer Series and Masters, scoring at 96% this year. $350,000 increase in prize money for a total of $2.5 million. Yet another new hosting facility in the Canada House. It hosted the Fiducia Nations Cup qualifier as well, with two teams per nation. And it held the inaugural CP Masters Grand Prix for a record $1.5 million, making it the richest person show jumping. And here to accept the award is Ben Aslan. It's a great honor for me to be able to be here with you this evening to represent uh, Spruce Meadows. Um, my grandparents established the facility 40-some years ago, and uh, it's been a long but uh, very fun uh, time. Uh, Linda Southern Hepcock, president of Spruce Meadows, has asked me to convey how sorry she is that she can't be with us this evening to receive this most prestigious award. It's such an honor for the Spruce Meadows uh, team to be ranked number one by the North American Riders Group. And Linda and their team are very appreciative of the assessments and evaluations that the Board of Governors prepare each year on tournaments around North America. She recognizes how many hours and work uh, is involved in organizing and determining the final assessment. And Linda and her team, thank you most sincerely for your constructive critique and appreciate all of NARC's comments. And again, in 2015, we we'll spent the necessary time to fully understand the comments so that they can pick can continue to improve Spruce Meadows each and every year. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. And now I'd like to uh, turn this over to our president, Chris Kapler, and he's going to give you a report on the Riders Grant and wrap up the Thank you, Beasy. Thank you, I'd like to begin by thanking the uh, Southern Hethcott family for generously providing for this NAR grant. Uh, not only does this provide financial support, but I hope that it really gives recognition of achievement that they can carry forward in the future on uh, potential resumes, future jobs. I think it's something they can really bring with them. Um, this year, we actually had an amazing, impressive group of riders that applied. It was, it was spent a lot of time going through all the candidates. You can see uh, to the left all the criteria that they must meet in order to qualify to be an applicant. And uh, you can see all the stuff we've been working on. And honestly, this maybe was our biggest time consumer of the whole thing. It was uh, really, we spent personal hours going through all the applications. Uh, we had four different meetings with over three hours of time logged in, and we really, this was hotly contested, but um, I must say, in the end, we all worked together on this, and um, our 2015 winner is Julie Wells. I'd like to please thank her. USEF Talent Search Finals winner, 2005 Washington Finals winner. She's also the uh, a gold medal winner from Young Riders. But I think all of us really saw last year, and even different truly, you were just performing at every level, uh, whether it's schooling jumper, um, young horses, meter 40s, you were always right there. It was just with such care and understanding and dedication to your course. So, you know, that also then, you had incredible results in the Grand Prix with two major wins last year. And for that, on behalf of the Hepcot Southern family and our, we congratulate you on your win. Uh, the Southern Hedgehog family for sponsoring it, because without them it wouldn't be possible. And also, uh, to 
the North American Writers Group for picking me to be the one this year. Thank you.